Fructose is a mitochondrial poison, and it is such a poison that it is taken directly to the liver. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, do not get into the bloodstream, where it's detoxified into triglycerides, fat, and uric acid. What are the daily foods that people eat that harm them and why they need to cut out each of those foods? What are some of like the big no-nos in your eyes? Oh, wow. Where to, where to start? Well, um, the, the foods that people are eating uh, have been so adulterated that they're unrecognizable. And actually, one of the things that bothers me the most is the idea that you know, whole grains, whole grain goodness is somehow equated with good health. <laughs> and believe it or not, uh, the idea of having grains whole is, is really a very modern concept. Um, when, when I was growing up, uh, we had, of course, Wonder Bread. And we ate a lot of white bread and white pasta and white stuff. And nobody ever considered uh, putting wheat germ on anything except a few hippies. Uh, and it turns out that there were reasons why cultures like the Italians, like the French, uh, got rid of the wholeness in whole grain. Hmm. And uh, because these contain, as you know, and I know, and hopefully your listeners know, some little nasty plant proteins that are called lectins. And lectins uh, are one of the best ways I have ever found for causing leaky gut. And uh, this was among other things proven by uh, Dr. Alessio Fasano, who's now at Harvard. Who, who showed, uh, particularly in the case of gluten, which is a lectin, that gluten is really good at uh, causing leaky gut or intestinal permeability. And why anybody would want intestinal permeability, uh, particularly if they want to be a genius going on later in life, um, is, is beyond my comprehension. I'll start there. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, isn't the isn't the opposite of whole grains refined grains though? Like if we're if we're not eating whole grains, does that mean we're supposed to eat refined grains? No, uh, because gluten is actually um, not removed by refining. It is actually more concentrated. But there's some real mischief makers in the halls of grains. Mm. For instance, wheat germ uh, which is a little tiny lectin that can get through the wall of our gut uh, without leaky gut, is in the hall of, uh, of wheat, rye, and barley. So, but your point is well taken. Uh, when cultures, uh, let's use the Italians, for example, uh, do use refined flour to make pasta, one of the things they do with pasta, and I spend a lot of time studying over there, is they undercook their pasta, number one, and that makes it much more difficult difficult and slow to digest into simple sugars. The other thing that strikes me with a number of my patients with autoimmune diseases, who when we do testing uh, for the causes of their leaky gut, almost, almost every one of them has antibodies to the various uh, parts of wheat, including wheat germ gluten and gluten uh, and non-wheat proteins. And over the course of a year of uh, treating them and sealing their leaky gut, uh, about 95% of these people actually lose all of their antibodies to the various components of wheat. They forget their immune system is actually retrained. But what happens to a lot of these people is they'll go over to Italy, or they'll go over to France and they'll have the croissant, they'll have the pizza, and they don't react. They, they don't flare their psoriasis. They don't feel pain in their joints. Um, their gut doesn't bother them. And they, they come back and they say, this is great. You know, I'm cured. I now can tolerate all these foods that Dr. Gundry, you know, forbade. And they start eating our bread and our pizza, 
And within either a day or a week, um, their psoriasis flares or rheumatoid arthritis back and they go, what the heck? You know, I thought I was cured. And I think that's the second point that uh, you know and I know that most of our food has been tainted by glyphosate mm. Roundup. And I wrote about this in the last book, The Energy Paradox. Um, glyphosate in and of itself is really good at causing leaky gut uh, without any other help from anything else. And people sadly don't know that almost all of our food is contaminated with Roundup. And we, we associate Roundup with GMO foods, but in fact, now Roundup is sprayed as a desiccant to kill fields and make them ready for harvest you know, on a scheduled basis. So almost all of our wheat, almost all of our corn, almost all of our soybeans, canola, um, you name it, oats is sprayed with Roundup uh, to make it harvestable. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, and then, it's in our California wines. Um, it's, it's everywhere. And so we're just awash with it. And so when somebody goes over to Europe where it's far less common and where it's being banned now repeatedly, um, they're eating, you know, pasta or breads that um, are far less worrisome because they're not contaminated with glyphosate. And that's, over the last, I don't know, 10 years, that's been a real eye-opener for me is the difference in, in what are seemingly identical foods, but they're grown here versus grown over there. That is fascinating. What are some other general, oh, this is so helpful, what are some other general guidelines that you could offer uh, for us to avoid or at least to minimize our exposure to, to glyphosate? So, you know, if at all possible, buy organic or even biodynamic uh, wines. Uh, it's easier to find now. We're beginning to um, have biodynamic uh, growers uh, in California. I know several winemakers in the Santa Barbara area who are now biodynamic and organic. Uh, in general, Europe is way ahead of us in biodynamic and organic whining, uh, wineries. A lot of the French wines, a lot of the Italian wines are organic now. A lot of the Austrian wines are organic. So if in doubt, um, I hate to say this, you know, buy, buy French or Italian or, or, or Australian wines. So that's one way. Sadly, even organic may not be glyphosate free. And I'll give you an example. Um, there's a, a winemaker in Santa Barbara County, Beckman Vineyards, and the Beckmans are a biodynamic uh, vineyard and have been for a number of years. And I've talked to him and I, there's this patch of vines uh, that and he said, well, wait a minute, that doesn't say it's biodynamic. He says, yeah, that's because it abuts our neighbor and our neighbor sprays with glyphosate and it drifts. And so we can't get it certified. Um, and, and so there's a lot of organic oat products that have actually been, um, you know, organic, but in fact, they uh, have had drift on them. Plus, you, you probably know there was a, a huge um, controversy that I think the New York Times found that there was a, a gentleman who will go on name that was buying up uh, organic farms for producing organic wheat and organic corn. And there were small plots. And then he was buying up industrial farms. And he got his certification for these small plots and he applied his certification to all of the normal plots that were being sprayed with Roundup and glyphosate. Mm. And, it, and it wasn't until recently that he was actually caught. And so almost everything that he was selling as organic was con conventionally farmed. Wow. Fascinating. Wow. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, so, okay, we talked about whole grains. I just have to ask: brown rice or white rice? Just oh, white rice. White rice. 
Yeah. Brown rice is, I can't tell you the number of people with autoimmune diseases that I see that brown rice is one of their biggest culprits. And when we switch them over to white basmati rice or even pressure cooked rice, um, that's the problem starts resolving right away. You also get, uh, the, there's the potential for exposure to arsenic in brown Very rice. Very true. Very true. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. Okay. So we've yeah, bummer. Because we've been told for decades, right? Like to, right. to like if it's if it's brown, like avoid the white carbs, right? Right. I feel but like that's that's still something that's echoed amongst some in the nutritional orthodoxy, right? Avoid the white carbs. Yeah, but I, you know, I think the other thing that is is sad is that labeling laws have been made to hide the actual sugar danger in products. And I, I actually had the former head of the FDA, um, Dr. Kessler on the Dr. Gundry podcast a while back. And he was actually in charge of the labeling law, the labeling on the back of a package. And he, as he tells the story, he gets a call from uh, President Reagan to, to get over to the Oval Office. There has to be a meeting. And there in the Oval Office are representatives of big agriculture. And I won't, won't name the names, but they're all there. And they basically said, you can't put this information on a label. And he said, what are you talking about? You know, it's, uh, I'm telling people how much sugar is in there. They said, no, you, you can't tell people how much sugar is in this product. They'll never buy it. And he said, but, the, but that's how much sugar is in there. And they said, well, you're going to have to disguise it. You're going to have to put it someplace else that they won't see it. And so they agreed that if there were two sugar molecules bound together with a chemical bond, you no longer had to call it sugar. You could call it a complex carbohydrate. Mm. Mm. So, and he uses the example of a bagel, which was great. And he says, okay, you know, we've got a bagel, it's 300 calories. And you look down and it says zero sugar or one gram of sugar. And you go, oh, great. Uh, and then you look at, total carbohydrates. And it's like, you know, 40 grams of, of total carbohydrates and, but no sugar. Well, and as I write in my books, what you got to do is you got to take the total carbohydrates and you got to subtract the fiber, which we don't digest. And let's suppose there's two grams of fiber. So there's now 38 grams of sugar in that bagel, not one gram of sugar. And just for people to grasp what that is, there's four grams of sugar in a teaspoon. So in that bagel, it, it, he, and he does the math, there's like 10 teaspoons of sugar in that healthy sugar-free bagel. And, and people go, well, I don't taste the sugar. And you're right. It, it's, you know, it's well hidden, but uh, I'll give you an example from actually yesterday with a patient. I had a patient who's He's a, he's a pre-diabetic and I've got him on, you know, what I think is my uh, ketogenic diet and his triglycerides are high and he's got insulin resistance and I'm going, you're eating a ton of sugar. He said, Oh no, I don't eat any sugar. Mm. And I he said, no, it's, it's out of my diet. I, you know, I eat no candy, I no desserts. And I said, okay. Uh, what, what'd you have for breakfast this morning? And he says, Oh, I had sugar-free rice checks and I go sugar-free rice checks. He says, yeah, you know, it's got the heart healthy seal on it. And I said, oh, I tell you what, let's pull up the box of rice checks. And I pulled up on the phone and sure enough, there's, you know, one gram of sugar and 44 grams of carbohydrate and actually no fiber. So this guy's having 11 teaspoons in his bowl of sugar-free rice checks and is wondering, you know, he's eating sugar-free and he's wondering why he's still a diabetic and he's got high insulin levels and he's not losing weight. It's because we've been fooled. <laughs> and the glucose molecules begin to break apart before you even swallow Right? Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, white bread has a glycemic index of 100. It's the perfect glucose delivery device that's ever been invented. 
Wow. So we're talking, <laughs> we're talking about grains, but I'm assuming that the next food that you might, uh, urge our, our viewers to steer and our listeners to steer clear from is sugar. True. We, uh, we are awash in sugar and unfortunately sugar is also well hidden with other names. Um, like, you know, like, pure cane sugar somehow that's better um high fructose corn syrup um normally and people somehow don't associate that sugar table sugar is sucrose and it's half glucose and half fructose high fructose corn syrup usually is about 55 percent fructose uh, and 45 percent glucose but it can be manipulated higher uh, fructose in and of itself has a much sweeter taste than glucose and um, uh, my good friend david Palmreiter and i uh, have, have been on our horse for a long time to please have people recognize how much fructose is hidden in so many of our prepared foods uh, and fructose is actually the, the evil sugar. Uh, tell you a fascinating story years ago when I was kind of first getting into this, a, uh, a major nutraceutical company that made a lot of protein drinks and protein powders wanted to have me uh, consult with them and me, be an advisor and wonderful people uh and almost every one of their weight loss shakes and protein powders had fructose as the main ingredient and i go well geez this is a non-starter you know it, this this is stuff is poison they said what are you talking about fructose is great because it doesn't raise insulin and <laughs> and, and that's why it's there and you know it's 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 a miracle and i i and this was, oh boy, almost 20 years ago. And we, to this day, people still think of fructose uh, and, and fruit as, you know, as somehow really healthy without realizing that number one, fructose is hiding everywhere these days, particularly in high fructose corn syrup. But even our fruit has been bred for sugar content. Um, there's now in an, in an apple, there's more sugar than a whole Hershey's candy bar. Wow. Yeah. And when I was growing up, you know, back in the dark ages, uh, an apple was the size of kind of a pixie tangerine. And now an apple, of course, is the size of a grapefruit and, and the names give it away, you know, like honey crisp or <laughs> ambrosia. And these things just did not exist. Uh, for fun, for one of my podcasts, I, I bought a little bag of mini apples that were at Bristol Farms, Whole Foods, and then bought a, a regular apple right next to it, an organic one. And you could actually, and mini apples was what we ate when I was a kid. And you could get, I put it together, there were about six mini apples that occupied the space of the current single apple. And quite frankly, an apple a day might have kept the doctor away 50 years ago, but an apple a day now is a really good way to increase your sugar load without knowing it. No, oh, Dr. G, don't take my honey crisp apples away from me. See, I, I, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I love them too much. I love them too much. So one thing that you are, we're, we're talking about fructose and one thing that you often see fructose marketed as, as being diabetic friendly, but you're, what I, what I think that you're, you've alluded to is that this is completely uh, misguided. Is that, is that accurate? Yes, that's correct. Uh, in fact, in my last book, the energy paradox, I really spent a long time debunking the myth that fruit fructose is diabetic friendly. In fact, it's really good at producing diabetes and insulin resistant. Mm. Fructose is a mitochondrial poison and it is such a poison that it is taken directly to the liver. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, do not get into the bloodstream where it's detoxified into triglycerides, fat, and uric acid. 
And as you and I both know, uric acid is pretty bad for everything. It's great for raising blood pressure. It's great for killing kidneys. It's great for causing gout. And it's actually great for storing fat. Uh, in fact, um, great apes only gain weight during fruit season. And fruit does not ripen year round in the jungle. It ripens on a seasonal basis. So uh, as I show in the energy paradox, fructose actually is one of the biggest causes in and of itself for insulin resistance and for actually stopping mitochondrial energy production. Uh, it's really good for gaining weight. Uh, and as anyone knows, one of the best ways to gain weight is to raise your insulin level. And insulin is the fat storage hormone. So anyhow. Yeah. And fructose, as you mentioned, high fructose corn syrup is in actuality only about 55% fructose. Right. Uh, table sugar is about 50% fructose. Agave syrup is something that, that you see a lot of health-minded individuals reach for instead of cane sugar. But agave syrup, as I understand it, is actually among the highest in fructose concentration in the supermarket. Correct. And agave, yeah, agave gets, you know, oh, it's healthy and, you know, it's, it's fructose and that's safe. There is agave inulin. And people hear agave inulin, and inulin happens to be this wonderful prebiotic fiber that we cannot digest, we cannot absorb inulin, and it feeds good gut buddies. And I can't tell you a number of people who write to me and they say, you're telling people to have agave. And I thought, I'm not telling people to have agave. I'm telling people to avoid agave. They, oh, no, agave inulin. I said, no, that's totally different. Yeah, stay away from agave syrup. It's just pure fructose. Yeah. Speaking of gut, uh, our gut buddies, um, what are some other ways that we can keep them happy? Because I know that this plays a large role um, in terms of keeping our immune systems healthy and robust, play, uh, plays a large role in, um, in, in, in regulating levels of inflammation in our bodies, among other things. So talk to me about, talk to me about that, the gut, our gut buddies, the microbiome. Well, I talk about, you know, your area of interest. Uh, we're, we're learning literally with every passing day that if we want to have good brain health, um, it's dependent on us having good uh, gut health and good gut buddies. Uh, more and more, we're realizing that most of the brain uh, protecting compounds uh, are actually coming from our microbiome. And, you know, who would have guessed um, before 12 years ago that our brain had anything to do with our gut? The only people who knew uh, were actually women. Uh, women have known forever. They have a gut feeling hmm. and guys are, you know, we have no gut sense of anything. <laughs> Uh, and they were they were right about this. And as you know, from from your research, uh, what goes on in our gut is really going to affect, well, every organ system, but particularly our brain. Um, I was talking with um, David Perlmutter off camera and I said, you know, it's really funny. Um, you're a neurologist and I'm a heart surgeon cardiologist. And. The fact is, all you and I talk about is the gut and mm -hmm. the microbiome. I said, isn't that hilarious that, you know, we've all converged from our various specialties down in the gut where, you know, none of us would have even thought of being interested in it. And he says, yeah, you know, Hippocrates was right. You know, 2,500 years ago, all disease begins in the gut. And the guy was right. And he didn't have our sophisticated tests, but he uh -huh. knew it. It's fascinating. I mean, but, you know, like the heart to some to the untrained person listening, the heart, the brain, the gut, completely disconnected organ systems. So what is then the connection? How does the gut influence the heart, the brain? Well, I got interested in the gut uh, because I became convinced working with my patients um, that leaky gut was actually the cause of coronary artery disease. And I went out uh, to figure out you know, why th that was happening. Um, you know, uh, Dale Bredesen, um, you know, end of Alzheimer's, uh, 
started looking at the gut because uh, he realized that amyloid is actually produced in the gut. Uh, that's where it comes from initially. And he started feeling and, and finding that amyloid leaking out of the gut and then getting into the brain is a piece of the process that um, facilitates more amyloid and tau production in the brain. And I think both of us uh, and others, obviously, um, began to realize that there are when bacterial particles actually leak through the wall of the gut, this sets up a we'll talk about the brain for a minute, a, an early warning system with our microglial cells. You know, microglial cells are the bodyguards of the brain. They're specialized immune cells, as you know. And they're, they're basically, you know, the bodyguards of neurons. And uh, just for our viewers and listeners, neurons talk to other neurons via dendritic processes. They grow telephone lines to talk to the next guy. And what happens is that if the microglia are alerted that mischief is happening down below in the gut and that literally bacterial particles and or lectins are loose, that the microglia to protect the neurons actually begin to munch away on the dendritic processes of the neurons to literally kind of call the troops back into the mother fort and pull up the drawbridge. And this was actually first discovered with Lewy bodies and Lewy body dementia. Uh, the, one of the hallmarks of Parkinson's is a dead neuron surrounded by glial cells. And the shocker was that you could find Lewy bodies in the neurons in, in the gut, in the gut wall. And they're going, well, what the heck are those guys doing there? Why is a dead neuron surrounded by glial cells? And people started putting two, to, two together and said, wait a minute, Parkinson's doesn't come from the brain and then associates with constipation. Parkinson's begins in the wall of the gut and goes to the brain. Um, and it's like, holy cow, you know, we, we got all this so backwards. Fascinating. There was that study a couple of years ago, right, with patients that had undergone a vagotomy yep. where they had the vagus nerve severed. And there was a when they tracked these patients over time, there was a dramatic risk reduction for those that underwent this procedure for developing Parkinson's disease. Yeah, 50% reduction uh, in people who had a vagotomy, which was our old way of treating ulcer disease. Um, I did a lot of vagotomies when I was training as a general surgeon. And yeah, so they, they were able to track these people for you know 50 years. And people uh, who had vagotomies uh, had much less Parkinson. And it was actually a study that I cited in the, the Plant Paradox that you can actually trace lectins climbing the vagus nerve to the brain in animal models uh, of leaky gut. And so it's like, holy cow, who, you know, who could have imagined, except Hippocrates, that the things that were happening in the gut was, uh, was, hap was happening to our blood vessels, was happening to our brain. And there is a uh, autoimmune theory of heart disease that I like. And uh, we attack our own blood vessels uh, because of things leaking from our gut. Rather than cholesterol being you know, the evil empire, uh, Michael DeBakey, one of the world's most famous fathers of heart surgery from Houston, Texas, used to say the cholesterol has nothing to do with heart disease, that it was an innocent bystander and that it was just kind of a patch that was patching irritated spots on blood vessels, kind of like a, you know, a, a patch on a pothole. And the more things got irritated, the more patch was applied, but it, it itself wasn't the culprit. It was just, you know, it was there patching your inflammation. Wow. Fascinating. So when you see somebody that presents with high cholesterol, do you treat the cholesterol first? Do you look to see what may be causing the cholesterol to be elevated? Yeah. So uh, 
I actually had a great patient today with that with a similar story. This is a woman who is now in her late 50s who runs total cholesterols well into the five and six hundreds. Wow. And she um, has used to, when I first met her, she had an LDL cholesterol of four hundred and sixty nine. Wow. And, yeah. And she actually ate a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of sugars, and but fairly thin. And through uh, through the years, a uh, couple years, we now have her triglycerides, which used to be about 400. Uh, we got her down to 79 uh, today. And now her HDL is actually higher than her triglycerides. And we have very sophisticated ways of now measuring whether uh, cholesterol is activated, whether it's sticky, whether it wants to stick to blood vessels. And for the first time, actually, this morning, she no longer has, uh, it's called OxPL-APOB. And it's a really cool measurement of the entire oxidized f uh, spectrum of cholesterol that uh, is in us. And there's a few labs that now are offering this. If you can't get that, most labs like Quest and LabCorp will measure oxidized LDL, which is a good second uh, placeholder. And I have people with you know, two, 300 LDLs. They don't, they don't oxidize their LDL, uh, thankfully, following my diet. And so I don't worry about them. Um, as long as they're not oxidizing their cholesterol, they, they can have a high cholesterol. There was this really interesting paper that I was reading just a couple of, uh, of weeks ago that found, I believe it was a, I believe it was a trial where they fed people a diet enriched with olive oil and then compared it to a diet enriched with linoleic acid, which is the fatty acid found predominantly in grain and seed oils like canola oil, corn oil, soybean oil, grapeseed oil, you name it. Um, all, all of those industrially refined oils that the standard American diet is just a wash in. And they found that for the because the, the 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 fats that we eat, correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm speaking, you know, if I'm if I'm miscommunicating this, integrate themselves into all aspects of our physiology, not least of which are LDL lipoproteins. And so when you enrich our, your LDL lipoproteins with monounsaturated fat, which extra virgin olive oil is, is abundant in, it seems to, to dramatically reduce the risk that those particles are going to get oxidized, that they're going to be able to adhere to um, immune cells, which could then potentially create the foam cell that initiates atherosclerosis. Did I properly communicate, describe that? Yeah, but there's actually a, a, a more important proviso that I think has been missed about monounsaturated fats. Um, a few years ago, I met with the, the head of the Olive Oil Council in, in Italy, who was a physician. And he said, you know, people don't need to understand that monounsaturated fat oleic acid is nothing unique, but it's a carrier for the polyphenols that are actually the beneficial part of olive oil. Mm. And that the more polyphenols that you have in olive oil, the better. And he says, people should just kind of forget about monounsaturated fats, but should think about the amount of polyphenols that is being carried. And it's the polyphenols that actually prevent the oxidation of, of LDL. And years ago, I published a paper looking at flexibility in blood vessels and inflammation in blood vessels, which we can measure. And we had people follow a, a low lectin diet, but put them on grapeseed extract and have them use olive oil and another polyphenol called pycnogenol, French maritime tree bark, hmm. and some fish oil. And we showed that when they did this, their blood vessels became flexible, the markers of inflammation on their blood vessels went away. And then once these people had normal looking numbers, a number of them said, oh good, my blood vessels are great now. I don't have to do the olive oil, I don't have to take the supplements. And a bunch of these people came back for the next blood work and we're back to square one. They're stiff blood vessels, they're inflamed. And I'm going, 
what the heck happened? They said, oh, well, I was so good. I don't, I don't need those anymore. And mm-hmm. so we put them back on it. And within three months, we were back looking at normal blood vessels. It's actually kind of fun. Wow. You're kind of famous at this point for saying that food exists to draw extra virgin <laughs> olive oil into your mouth. That's so true. Uh, You know, there's several of the blue zones use a liter of olive oil per week. Uh, There's a very famous study out of Spain, the Predamed study, uh, looking at 65 year old individuals uh, who uh, had known coronary artery disease. They had a stent or a bypass and they were followed for five years, five years. They were compared. They were put on a Mediterranean diet with a liter of olive oil per week. And they actually had to take their container of olive oil to the clinic empty and exchange it every week. So I knew now they could have been pouring it out, but I doubt it. (laughs) And they were compared to a low fat Mediterranean diet. And in fact, the olive oil group uh, had lots of amazing changes. They actually had a demonition in the new events uh, compared to the low fat group who had still accelerated events from the brain standpoint it turns out their their memory the olive oil group had improved memory at the end of five years when they hit 70 than they had when they were 65 the low fat group had no benefit and then an interesting side point of the study was the women uh, had a i'm blanking on the right number i think about a 70% decrease in breast cancer in the high dose olive oil group compared to the low fat group. And it's like, holy cow. I mean, you know, so the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. You're mm-hmm. right. And that's the PREDIMED study. That's a, that's, a, that's a seminal study in the field of nutrition because it's a randomized controlled trial. It was multi-center, large population, long-term. Yeah. And the, the fascinating thing is the the low fat vegan community uh, community just thinks that study should be you know thrown in the trash that it was fraudulent and it, it, it's like come on it, really and uh, why is they, that because 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 the, there are some within the vegan community that think that all oils are unhealthy is that right, it right yeah and that you know that that came really, you know, out of the the seven countries style uh, trial, which really wasn't a seven countries uh, with with Dr. Keys and the idea that saturated fat was somehow, you know, evil, and that heart disease was caused by you know saturated fat consumption, and in the seven countries study. And I talk a lot about it in the new book, Unlocking the Keto Code. Uh, Dr. Keyes picked the seven countries that he wanted to show was the problem. And so he, he chose the United States. He chose Japan. He chose Finland. He chose Italy. Uh, he chose um, the Netherlands. And he didn't chose, choose France. Um, and because if you look at France, it totally upsets his model. Uh, the French eat uh, three times as much cheese and butter that Americans do. And yet the French have a third of the coronary artery disease that Americans do. And it doesn't fit the model. And mm-hmm. sadly, uh, when things don't fit the model, you tend to uh, throw them out. Yes. Uh, it's the so-called French paradox. Yeah, it's uh, there's a really great book. Uh, I'm blanking on the author. It's up here on my shelf someplace. Uh, the the former food editor for Vogue wrote a book called uh, called I Can't Believe I Ate the Whole Thing, <laughs> and uh, he had a whole chapter on oh, why aren't the French dead, and it was all about you know this enormous amount of cheese uh, that the French eat. And, you know, why aren't they dead? And I I go into actually why that is in the new book. There's actually a really good reason for it. Oh, man. Well, you can't, like, leave us hanging like that. Well, I'll give you a tease. Um, Actually, I'll give you a really good tease. Uh, I cut (laughs) it. uh, My editor cut it from the book because it it was too, I think, in people's faces. So 
uh, the Blue Zones. Dan Butner coined the Blue Zone, and uh, you know, with National Geographic. And these are places in the world uh, where people live the longest and healthiest, and they do have some common features that both Dan and I agree with. I happen to have spent most of my career in the only blue zone in the United States, Loma Linda, California, where I was a professor. And I'm actually the only nutritionist, as far as I know, who's spent most of his life in a blue zone. And one of the unique things about two of the blue zones that gets missed, Sardinia, and the Nagoya Peninsula of Costa Rica. And these are supposedly really, really healthy places because they eat a lot of grains and they eat a lot of beans. And in fact, they do eat a lot of grains and they do eat a lot of beans. But if you look at the Sardinians who have longevity, they live up in the hills and they don't come down to the sea. They are sheep and goat herders. Uh, the people who live down by the sea, and this has been done, do not have increased longevity. Only the people who live in the mountainous areas. And so you look at the difference in their diet, and there's one difference in their diet, and that is the folks who live up in the mountain eat a huge amount of goat and sheep cheeses. Mm. Mm. You look at the Nagoya Peninsula, Yes, they eat corn and beans, but what makes them unique compared to other parts of Costa Rica is their sheep and goat herders, and they eat a huge amount of goat and sheep cheese. So what is it about goat and sheep cheese that makes them have such longevity? Well, there's actually two factors, actually three. One, goat and sheep milk is 30% medium chain triglycerides. Wow. Wow. So you're getting MCT oil every time you eat a, a goat or a sheep product, mm. whether it's goat yogurt, whether it's goat cheese. The second thing that cheeses produce in the fermentation product process is polyamines. And I wrote about this in the previous books. So polyamines, uh, one of the most famous is spermidine. And your listeners can guess where that was, that name came from. <laughs> and there's another one called putrescine. And cheeses, aged cheeses are loaded with these compounds. And these compounds actually promote longevity. And the T's of how they pronounce promote longevity, um, you'll find in the book, and it's not what you think. Um, so there's the other thing that's cool about MCT oil, as most people know, is that MCT oil is taken directly from the gut to the liver, where it is converted instantaneously to ketone bodies. And ketone bodies, are not a miraculous fuel. So anybody who's uh, into ketone, sorry, guys, you're going to have to read the book, but ketones are a horrible fuel. Mm -hmm. But ketones are signaling molecules that tell our mitochondria to actually repair themselves and make more of themselves. And it's, it's a process called mitochondrial uncoupling. And it's the whole premise of why it going in and out of ketosis on a 24 hour basis is so good for you, but it's why MCT oil is so good for you because you can actually produce ketones without being on a high fat ketogenic diet. For I instance, I would joke about this. So I could have a fruit salad and have goat yogurt and I would manufacture ketones. And this has actually been shown very well, even though I had that, big giant fructose bomb, but I'd still make ketones. That is fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people think that the magic of ketones and ketogenic diets, especially as they pertain to neurological conditions is that the, they provide this alternate fuel source. But I think it's, it is an underappreciated aspect of ketone bodies that they do have this signaling effect. Yeah. And, and even, and this was work that that came out of uh, Harvard with Dr. Cahill and Dr. Owens, even at full ketosis, uh, the brain, as you know, um, still wants 
30 to 40 percent of its needs met by glucose right. and even at full ketosis. And as Dr. Owen showed in uh, the early 2000s in human volunteers, that even at full ketosis, only 30 percent of human energy needs are met by ketones. That's it at full ketosis. Uh, free fatty acids are obviously how we meet our energy needs. But as you know, free fatty acids are too big to get past the blood brain barrier at any speed. Uh, and ketones exist because they're short chain fatty acids that are water, water soluble that easily pass through the brain. But their benefit is not as a super fuel for the brain. Their benefit is actually the signaling effect of mitochondrial uncoupling that actually treats neurons to a treat that uh, is not as a fuel. Wow. But it's in the book. Amazing. No, I, I, I can't wait to get my hands on it. Um, I know. I can't believe you do not have your hands on it. I, I apologize. Know. I, I Shame know. Well, on me. Well, no, I mean, I mean, I love all your other books, so I'm sure that uh, that I'm going to enjoy this one as well. So wait, in, d during states, during starvation, the brain obviously is going to use ketones, but the, the free fatty acids, what are those taken up and and, and oxidized by like muscle? So, yeah. So free fatty acids are used by muscle uh, as their primary fuel. The other thing that happens is as long as you can release free fatty acids from fat and people don't realize if they're insulin resistant, guess what? Uh, you're not going to release free fatty acids out of your fat cells. Insulin blocks it. So free fatty acids can then part, go to the liver where they're made into ketone bodies. But the reason ketone bodies exist is to keep the brain holding on until the, the next meal arrives. And so they're not, they're not a miracle fuel. I, I, I used to think they were a miracle fuel. They're not. Um, well, it seems like the influence that ketone bodies have on the brain is something that our hunter-gatherer ancestors would have experienced on a daily, monthly, seasonal, annual basis, at least some point in the year, you, it's, it would be safe to assume that a hunter-gatherer was experiencing that their brain was, having, was getting access to these ketone bodies. Correct. In fact, it should happen every day. Uh, normally, and I talk about this in the book, normally we should cycle in and out of ketosis on a daily basis. Uh, after about eight, if, an, if you have no, metabolic flexibility, and that means the ability to either use glucose or amino acids to generate ATP or use free fatty acids to generate ATP. If you have the ability to switch back and forth on those fuel choices, which is metabolic flexibility, then you, sh you actually have perfect health. Half of normal weight individuals in the United States have no metabolic flexibility. Half. 88% of overweight individuals have no metabolic flexibility. And 99% of obese individuals have no metabolic flexibility. And what's so scary about that is uh, we, most people, are addicted to using glucose as their only source of fuel for their neurons, uh, which is actually pretty scary. Um, and it's no wonder when we develop insulin resistance in the brain, type three diabetes of the brain, that our nerve cells start dying because they're mm. literally starving to death because they can't, you won't generate ketones as a backup fuel for the brain. Wow. So what are some, I mean, what are some high level, high level, low hanging fruit that um, can help people regain metabolic flexibility? If you're saying it's such a minority of us that are truly metabolically flexible, what are some things that we can do to fix that situation? Well, I think the easiest way, and this is, uh, you know, really uh, sentinel work by uh, Rafael de Cabo from the NIH, where I was a fellow uh, years ago. But he became convinced that the benefit of calorie restriction, which is really one of the only known ways to extend lifespan in most organisms, the benefit wasn't in actually the calorie restriction. It was the fact that in animal models, you 
put out the food usually on a daily basis. And the calorie restricted animals were basically so hungry that they ate all their food almost immediately. And that it was the period of time, the extended period of time that the animals weren't eating, who were calorie restricted, that explained the difference, that it was actually the period of time uh, that they were fasting every 24 hours that was the difference. And he designed a really cool mouse model uh, at the NIH to prove it. And in fact, he showed that it was the timing of the meal and how long the mouse had to eat that meal that made all the difference. Um, and he found, for instance, that mice could be given a full day's ration. But if you put it out at three o'clock in the afternoon, that they'd finish their full day's ration in about 12 hours, and then they'd be fasting for 12 hours, which is actually a long time for a mouse. And he compared those mice to mice who got to munch on their food bowl, you know, 24 hours a day. And he found that the mice who got to munch 24 hours a day had no metabolic flexibility. But the mice who got the exact same amount of food, but it was controlled when they got it, had metabolic flexibility. And the cool thing is the mice who got the full amount of food, but in a confined eating space, lived 11% longer than the mice who got the same amount of food. And they rarely died of cancer, which is a big cause of mice. And they didn't have any amyloid plaques in their brain compared to the uh, all day munchers, as I call them. So action plan, the more we compress our eating window down to about six to eight hours every day, uh, which is doable and in the energy paradox and in the new book, I take people through an easy way to do it. Just one hour a week change over a five week period will get you to compress your eating window and easily, easily done. And that can have just such a profound effect. For instance, if you extrapolate the mice study, doing that and still getting everything you want to eat uh, will extend a human's lifespan by good lifespan by 10 years. Hmm. Not bad. That's, I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, not bad. Yeah, it's not <laughs> bad. But I mean, when you're eating, you still have to eat you still have to be mindful of what you're eating, right? Like just the, the just compressing your feeding window isn't a free pass to eat all the crap you no, want. Right? No, as I write as I write in my books, that does not allow you and me to have a pound of M and M peanuts as as our you know sole food. <laughs> uh, Darn yeah, it. and in fact, that was shown in the study. Uh, one of the groups of animals were given actually a high sugar uh, diet. And they still got the benefits. But interestingly enough, the high sugar rats, when they die, they died of liver cancer, aggressive liver cancer compared to the non high sugar rats. Um, so you're right. And there's no true free pass. Um, yeah, you can't have your cake and eat it, too. But it does seem to confer benefits, which I think is a very empowering um, insight to have, especially for people who don't necessarily have access to the kind of pristine food environment that you or I have access to. No, you're right. Uh, and I think that's also brought home fascinating uh, Italian uh, athlete study that I mentioned in the book. They took uh, sets of Italian cyclists and they, for three months, gave them the exact same amount of food. Uh, and they divided them in, into two groups. <clears throat> One group ate a 12 hour eating window. They have breakfast at eight o'clock, they had lunch at one and they had to finish dinner by eight o'clock in, in the evening. The other group got the same amount of food, same training table. They ate breakfast, break fast at one o'clock in the afternoon. They had lunch at four o'clock in the afternoon and they had to finish dinner by eight o'clock. So they had basically a seven hour eating window. What's fascinating is only the same amount of food, only the compressed eating window athletes lost weight. The regular guys did not lose any weight. They maintained their muscle mass. But what's probably most striking is their insulin-like growth factors, IGF-1, which 
is probably our best predicate marker for longevity, uh, fell. And the folks who ate, you know, the 12-hour window had no uh, fall in their insulin-like growth factor. And when I look at super old people in my practice, late 90s, early 100s, these people all run insulin-like growth factors of 50 to 70. And uh, that's where you want to be. And so if, so if just compressing your eating window will let you lose weight and lower your insulin-like growth factor, you know, bring it on. Bring it on. Yeah. I, I, I aim to not eat for an hour or two or three sometimes after I wake up and I try my best not to eat for two to three hours before I go to sleep. Yeah. I find it much easier to control when I have my first meal of the day. It's a little bit more tricky to control when I have my last meal of the day because dinner tends to be our big social meal. Correct. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, if you're probably going to design the perfect intermittent fasting diet, you'd, you'd probably maybe have breakfast at nine o'clock in the morning and finish at three o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. But you're right. It's nearly impossible. You know, I, I'm now entering my, my 23rd year from January through June during the week. I condense all my meals to one meal a day wow. in, a, in a two hour window between six and eight o'clock at night. Now, why do I do that? Well, because that's when my wife and I are home, you know, and that's when we see each other. So would I be smarter, you know, to compress my eating window, maybe midday? Yeah. But then I watch my wife eat dinner and, you know, I'd, I'd probably strangle her. <laughs> but, you know, so it's actually doable, but you're right. It's much easier to delay the first meal of the day in general. I love than, that. Than try to bring it down the other way. Hey guys, if you enjoyed that conversation, you're going to love this one. We maybe have talked about this offline, maybe online, but let's not make our nutrition our religion, right? There you it's, go. I um, love that. It, we have to be flexible to what works for us all the time. And um, so in the nutrition space, I always say, if it, if it makes sense to add it, add it. But we don't need to, I'm more about adding to your life and nourishing than I am about thinking that one way of eating is the only way. Um, and so I do see clients get really excited about really strict diets that aren't sustainable for them long term. Um, there's nothing wrong with a cleanse or, or pulling out some inflammatory foods and taking a, a break for 21 days to six weeks. You know, I've seen benefit of, in, of that clinically, whether it's someone with SIBO who needs to do a FODMAPS diet or hormonal issues, insulin resistance. There are definitely things dietary things that can decrease inflammation, improve the gut microbiome. But let's not jump on the train of this way is the only way because then you're never, that's confirmation bias. You're never asking yourself, does this still work for me? So when it comes to nutrition, I mean, the one thing that I always love is looking at someone's blood test. Like, let's get a NutraVal. Let's see. What's your amino acid profile look like? What's your fatty acid profile look like? Where are your B vitamins, your fatty, um, your, um, your fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K? Where are those levels? Okay. What kind of foods can you be eating to support optimizing those levels? Mm. So data is always really important to me. And then I love blood sugar. You know that I've been banging my little blood sugar drum for a decade. Yeah, you have. It's finally cool. Because of CGMs. <laughs> Are you still wearing one? Because I know that you, yeah. you oh, wow. It's on, it's on the back awesome. of my arm right now. So um, yeah, I mean, I love levels. I'm a huge fan. They're making that tech available to people. But what that does is that allows people to understand why they could have, maybe they could get away with some rice and their blood sugar is still balanced because they're super active. Instead of letting the world tell them it's horrible for them, mm. what works for you? So Health tech, I think, is really supportive of people making resolutions and sticking to them because that feedback. Yeah. Do you track your sleep as well? Uh, yeah. I'm not wearing my Aura Ring. It's actually charging right now. Oh, cool. um, but I love my Aura Ring. I just upgraded, like, you know, the version three that came out. Yeah. I was like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. But the Aura Ring is what gets me in bed around 930. Otherwise, I can sometimes be like up till 10, 30, 11, 12, 1 if I get real, you know really excited about a rabbit hole, I may be down it and that's dangerous. So the, the aura ring has shown me time and time again, like if I get in bed by 930 and I'm sleeping by 
10, which is really hard because you put your kids down and you're like, oh my God, I have an hour to two to myself. Um, I can see time and time again, I get twice the REM sleep, twice the deep sleep, and I feel like a totally different person. Wow. I was having a, actually, so I don't, I don't regularly wear any, any kind of tra like tracking device, but I do, I do have an aura ring, um, somewhere that I, <laughs> that I want to find. And I was, I was having a conversation last night. So recently, another thing that I've started doing, uh, another habit that I've, that I've started stacking, I, um, I mouth tape at night when I go to sleep, which I, I find to be amazing. It's, it's so great. First of all, I discovered, so I use an app sometimes called Sleep Cycle to wake me up, which is a great app. It wakes you up. It listen. It, it's like, a, it's, it uses your phone, micro, your phone's microphone. You put it by your bed and it listens to determine when you are in your lightest phase of sleep. REM sleep, during REM sleep, which is a very deep uh, stage of sleep, your body is basically paralyzed below the neck. And so it listens to make sure that there's movement. And so within a half an hour window of when you want to wake up, it wakes you up when it hears movement. So, and it, and it also tracks your sleep and it also records any noises that are made temporarily. It's like sounds. So, you know, I'm not a snorer, but like occasionally maybe you I can come to my house. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Chris is a major snorer. He's a major snorer. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I don't like chronically snore, but you know, if I do snore like once or twice, it has recorded it. And all I needed to do was hear myself snore. Yeah. And I was like, I'm fucking taping <laughs> yeah. my, I do not, I'm not snore. I'm not yeah. a snore. Yeah. Um, so I've started uh, mouth taping. And also, of course, we know how important nose breathing is, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so over the past couple of weeks, I've been religiously mouth taping before I go to sleep. I buy these like these, you know, I, I spend, it's like 10 bucks on Amazon. I get like 120 of these like strips. You just put it like on your lips and it keeps your, keeps your mouth closed when you're sleeping. So anyway, I was having this conversation last night with somebody who said that he, he was just, you know, offering his own anecdote uh, to the conversation that we were having. And he said that he, you know, he has an aura ring and before he was mouth taping, his heart rate, his overnight heart rate was at a certain number. I forget what the number was, but he saw that number plummet when he started mouth taping. Wow. Yeah. That, that n nose breathing caused a, a significant drop in his, his, in his overnight heart rate, which is obviously great. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So I want to run that experiment on myself and see if I exp Let's find that aura experience ring. the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was like going to look for it today and charge it up and, and yeah, try to get to it. Yeah. I mean, it's those types of insights, right. Which get you excited. Like you're having a conversation at dinner and now all of a sudden you're excited to check track your own sleep, knowing that you feel better mouth taping and all the benefits that have been documented. But now like, let's do a study N of one, yeah. you know, because it's really about your life. Like what's going to give you the most energy? What's going to get you the most excited uh, about working out or cooking healthy or, you know, getting consistent around something. So, um, yeah. I, and I also think we need to simplify, like just be minimalist in our life so that we are making the space and the time to get creative. We are creative beings. I know a lot of people, well, some people will say that they're not creative and they don't have a creative bone in their body, but I think that they just haven't given them, themselves the space to be creative and have an outlet. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think there's cre cre creativity exists in different contexts, right? Like right. we as a culture have decided that creativity means I'm able to paint or make music or whatever the, you know, whatever the medium happens to be. But you know, my brother is a software engineer. I'm sure he's very creative with his programming. Totally. I'm sure there are people who are creative wizards in Excel. <laughs> you know, like my assistant Sydney has been very creative with my schedule yeah. over the past couple of months. So yeah, creativity is like a totally, uh, you know, it's it's totally context. You know, it's a very context uh, dependent concept. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what about, I mean, like in nutri in the online wellness world, you see a lot of like black or white thinking, you know, like unless your diet is fully gluten-free or fully, you know, vegan or paleo or carnivore, you're not doing it right. How do people get past that sort of like, you know, mindset toxicity? Well, that's where I go back to blood sugar. Um, and that's where I go back to looking at maybe a NutriVal where I can see someone's nutrient levels personally. Um, I think people get really excited and dogmatic about something that's worked for them. Like someone who's dogmatic about being vegan or someone who's dogmatic about being carnivore might have had a personal experience that really was transcendent, 
transcendent for them. Like yeah. they just they heal, they they got rid of um, you know, depression or they they felt their best, they looked their best, whatever it was that was that positive reinforcement for them to do that diet, um, then they're gonna go around and be a prophet for it yeah. and preach. Exactly. Right. And and that's okay. I, I think what we need to do though is be open minded of other people's opinions. Um, and I think that that is actually a really big problem in in this world in general right now. It's um, it is this black and white thinking is this is right and this is wrong, my way or the highway. And unfortunately, it 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 shuts us off from learning and mm. being open to learning. We have these confirmation biases and we're constantly looking for ways to like prove our opinion. Um, and we just get stuck. And the problem with that is then we're not open to understanding if it's working for us long term. Like I have had clients who have, you know, unfortunately seen like a decrease in choline levels, vitamin D levels, B vitamin levels, and they've loved a specific diet for a really long time. And it may be totally deficient in those nutrients that they need, but they've talked about it to their friends for so long and they identify so deeply with that diet that they aren't actually even taking a minute to say like, this isn't working for me. Yeah. Maybe they've seen like a a celebrity or somebody like on a vegan diet, seemingly thriving. And they say to themselves, well, she's doing it. It's working for her. It's got to work for me. Right. And I, that's where I always go back to the data. And that's where I think health tech can be really supportive. I mean, I have vegan and vegetarian clients on CGMs. I have carnivore leaning clients on CGMs. I have intermittent fasting clients on CGMs. Wow. Like it's it that tech allows me to understand, hey, like you haven't eaten anything, but you had a major surge in blood sugar at this period point in time in the day. You weren't working out, you weren't over caffeinating. What was going on here? And what's coming to the surface for a lot of my clients is that they're like biochemistry is fully being affected by their mood and their stress levels. Mm. And we know that when we're feeling stressed, we have a surge of adrenaline, we have a surge of cortisol, and that impacts our blood sugar. That's going to impact our energy, our mood, our cravings, our ability to concentrate. It has a major impact. So whether it's the food that they're getting insight on or how just how they interact with the world, how that's impacting their like internal state, it's really priceless. Yeah. What about mindset? I mean, we, we're obviously, you know, I think heading in this direction, but a lot of people will attempt to change their behavior without addressing the core values underlying that behavior. You know, so they'll try, they'll make like the, they'll sign up for a gym, right? And everybody knows that these gyms are, that gyms are flooded in January, right? Yeah. With the, with the new signups, but that those people that haven't really changed the mindset, um, that they that it's not it's not a sustainable activity for them that they just drop off. Right. So what's like what are some mindset hacks that people can use? Well, you mentioned that you started going to therapy and then you started meditating. Um talking about like trends and thinking about mindset, we need to address the fact that we've come out of a pandemic, you know, and we have the highest rates of teenage suicide attempts, we have the highest rates of depression and anxiety and we're just going to throw a a workout routine on top of that that we're now going to be stressed out about and then feel bad when it fails like that's going to make us feel better right? right no it's not so much pressure that we right. put on ourselves it's a lot of pressure and so what i love is a focus on mental health i think you see places like okay human which is like the dry bar of therapy that just opened in la where you can just roll right in and it has cute little menu and you say, I would like the 45 minute like decompress or whatever. I don't mm. know what the menu titles are, but it we're getting rid of the stigma around mental health. I think, you know, you see things like trauma release therapy and psychedelics and all of these ways, these modalities to address underlying issues and traumas that affect our behavior. Mm. Like if you grew up and you had a major trauma or a chronic minor trauma that happened in your childhood and your behavior is a certain way because of it, it's really hard to just mandate yourself or like tell yourself, I'm going to go work out and I'm going to change my mindset. Like we have to, just like in functional medicine, we have to use holistic psychiatry to get to the root of the issue and start to heal because that's when we'll feel motivated to 
really get out there and go to the gym because we feel like it. Or maybe we're not going to stress eat or late night eat because we were doing that as a band-aid of these feelings of pain that we had in our from our childhood or from a breakup or from a mean boss. I don't know what it is. Yeah. You know, it's everyone has their own story. But I love that we're talking about mental health, that we're destigmatizing, getting help for it, and that people are healing because however they decide to heal or treat that, um, it's going to make them show up for the world, for themselves first in a totally different way and create a better place for all of us to be a part of. You know, we all have, we all have the responsibility to work on ourselves first. Absolutely. And the me- I'm so glad you brought up mental health. It's such a big, it's, it's such, such an important topic, especially today. Uh, you know, people are drinking more alcohol than, you know, al- alcohol sales are up. Um, so this is, yeah, it's definitely an important topic. For sure. Um, yeah. I, the therapy thing has been really, really great for me. I mean, I, you know, it's like, I've, I've never really had any mental health, like, challenges or anything like that. I think I've just experienced what the normal ebb and flow of human emotion. Um, but it's always great to have somebody who you're able to, uh, I could, sometimes I use this metaphor. It's like your sock drawer, you know, it's like, it's really hard to organize a sock drawer (laughs) or your underwear drawer without taking everything out first to like, you know, set everything right, like on the bed and then put it back in the drawer, you know? (laughs) And so I think I kind of see like having a therapist as being the person that you like take out the socks and the underwear and like set, you know, like lay it all out before attempting to like refold it and put it back in, like in a more, in a more organized fashion. And I think that that's, that responsibility is just too much for like a friend or a family member to, to burden them with. So, and there are also like a number of apps now that are available that make it like really easy and accessible. Um, cause there was a time when I couldn't afford a therapist. Right. Um, and I, and I, you know, cause I had been curious about seeing one for a long time before I actually pulled the trigger and started seeing one, um, on a, on a regular basis. But, um, but now there are like, you know, a bunch of different tools out there that are, that are, yeah, lowering the bar, which is great. Well, I think you said something that's really important. Like you you don't want to burden your friends or your family members with that, with whatever it is that you're dealing with. And I think that's something that I worry about for my kids. Like everyone's online and they're on social and it's surface level conversations, but the biggest gift you can give someone is just a non-judgmental ear, like someone who can truly listen and work things out with you. Um, But it is, it is, everyone needs that. And Therapists are just really good at it. Yeah. (laughs) They're really, they were educated to know how to do it, to support someone through their own thought process, to evoke things from people. So they're able to, like you said, it's almost like you're purging everything out onto your bed and then going like, okay, what's the most important things? How am I going to put those in the front of the front of the drawer? How am I going to like reprioritize what's important to me and, and like have a clear picture on my life? And most of the CEOs, actors, and like really successful people that I work with, they might call it a business coach. They might call it a mentor. They might call it a therapist. Um, but they have someone that they are bouncing ideas off of, working things through with, strategically having a plan about their life. Um, and so that's that's what I love about it is let's destigmatize it. Let's get people into seeing like whether it's a therapist or a counselor to support them. Um, because we all need to be listened to and we all need to kind of speak out loud to understand what our thoughts are sometimes. Yeah. I find, and I, I made this, uh, this observation actually yesterday, um, when I was with my therapist that one of the things that I particularly like about her is that she is a teacher and it made me realize that like when you see a doctor, the word doctor actually originates from the word teacher and but it's not, you know, this is not a quality that is exclusive to to doctors, right? I mean, I think like the best life coaches, the best nutritionists, they are teachers. They're giving you the tools so that you can be, you know, be better informed so that you can ultimately start to make these decisions on your own, mm-hmm. which is, I think, why, I mean, I, I love your work so much because that's what you are for your followers and for your clients. Well, I just, I can 
give you a PDF of what you should eat and not eat, sure, every day, but that's not that's not going to create the action and the sustainability that I would love for my clients. So yeah, we get, I'm a little bit annoying. We get into the (laughs) details on blood sugar and nutrient status and all kinds of stuff like that, but I'd rather teach them to fish. Yeah. So So. (laughs) it's, it's so important. Um, what about hydration? Does that play a a, a role in, in the recommendations that you make? Cause I find a lot of people should I just go up, get up and get my water bottle that's loaded yeah, with you, element? Yeah, you brought like you brought like it's like a gallon jug. Is there element in there? Yeah, we love element. Shout out to element. Yay, one of our, one thanks, of our, Rob Wolf. One of our sponsors. Yeah, <laughs> I drink about a packet a day at yeah. this point. I'm uh, sometimes at two, but I'm breastfeeding still, so it's um, really dehydrating to breastfeed. <laughs> Is yeah. it? Wow. Yeah, you it, you all. It also increases your calorie need, right? Uh, it does. It's. Um, it's fun. I can out eat Chris right now. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I really, I really focus on nutrient density at this point in my life. Like I love prenatal nutrition. I love pregnancy nutrition. I love postpartum nutrition. I love kids nutrition, but it's all like those periods of life. It's kind of like you're an athlete. Like you have to be focused on nutrient density. You have to be focused on hydration. You have to be focused on sleep much as you can when you have kids yeah, <laughs> or when you're, um, you know, a new mom. But yeah, I mean, that's been a major game changer for me. And I actually have a few dietitians that I work with, um, and have mentored that kind of live a low carbohydrate, slightly like metabolically flexible, maybe they're dipping into ketosis sometimes type of a, a lifestyle. And I have received the most amazing like texts and phone calls I mean, the reviews are insane. Like even people that I respect and refer clients to are like, Kelly, this stuff is game changing because it, feeling fully hydrated and having the, that mineral support is amazing for your brain. Like you can focus and you can have a conversation and, and it's, I think, great for killing cravings too. So it's a major, it's a major player for me. And probably one of those things that has come in in the last year and a half that is now a, a daily recommendation. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. The first one is happiness is a brain function. That I actually did a study for this book where we looked at 500 consecutive patients, Damon Clinic. So we gave them the Oxford happiness questionnaire, a really well-researched questionnaire about happiness. And then we looked at their brains and the people that were unhappy had lower activity, lower blood flow in the front part of their brain. 